All right, again, my name is Matt Dancho. I am the founder of Business Science. And uh, here's a little bit of information about me. Uh, we'll actually have that at the end of the, the, the um, presentation, so you can take a picture of it then. I'm gonna get into, uh, so what is business science? Well, besides the company that I created, uh, what it does is, is primarily three different things. First off, we are a business consultancy. So what we take pride in and what we really help organizations do is turn their data into insights uh, by util utilizing algorithms and presenting them to, uh, we'll say, non-technical people in a, in a very user-friendly way, so that way they can take advantage of data science and machine learning um, without having to know all of the, the, uh, the ins and outs of it. So we primarily do those with web applications uh, that, that we build and codify uh, to help them make decisions. Um, the second thing, we are an educator. So this really applies more to the data scientists um, we really take a lot of pride in educating. We have a, a, a blog on our website that is uh, very highly trafficked. Um, there's a lot of valuable information, and I'll talk more about that. We also have open source software uh, and some courses I'll talk about. And then the last thing is we are community driven. So we're powered by R, we're powered by data science. Um, we also are getting into Python as well and, and various other data science tools. But what we really enjoy doing is giving back to the community in the form of software and the form of education. Okay. So to explain this slide a little bit, let me give you some insights into some of the stuff that we see when we consult with organizations. Um, there's th really three things. People are good decision makers. That's the first thing. Second thing, people are good decision makers when they have data. The third thing, people are good decision makers when they are unbiased. So what am, what am I talking there about bias? Well, as, as a, uh, the human brain, as you can imagine, is, uh, is very skilled when it has the information available to it. But in certain circumstances, people can uh, default to their emotions, their biases. They may think that they know a problem, but, but really, they're, they're just going off of their gut instinct and not necessarily the truth, which is the facts that data can provide. So what we found is that when you provide data and information and insights to the decision makers within the organizations, uh, you can really get great decision making. Uh, we do this through a structured and systematic approach. Uh, it starts with this cycle here. Uh, the first thing that we do is we learn their system. And that's really just examining the business processes and understanding what they're going through within their data. The second thing is we model that data. We, once, we get, once we feel that we've gotten to a good model, we then convert that into something that's useful to the end user, meaning the decision maker. So um, just to give you an idea, that could be like a web application. That could be something as simple as just, you know, hey, this is true, false. This is, this is the answer that you're looking for. Um, whatever method or mechanism, it's typically like a web-based application. Um, that's how we provide those insights to the decision makers. Now, the reason it's a cycle is because you're never really done. And this is uh, when we think of AI in terms of working with business processes and business problems, um, it's what we're really talking about is the cycle of continual learning. So when, whenever you have a problem that you have machine learning, things can happen, things change. So you have to have a, an adaptive solution and really be able to have a robust process uh, with a feedback loop that is able to adjust when things change. So what we found is that systematic process can be applied to any problem. So it doesn't matter if like, it's an HR problem, which is what we'll talk about today. It doesn't matter if it's a manufacturing problem. Oh, there we go supply chain logistics, uh, fraud detection, any of these types of problems can be solved through the, the robust set of tools that we have out there with supervised or unsupervised learning, and just really uh, being able to apply machine learning to these, these processes. Next slide. All right, so that was more on the, how we work with businesses. Uh, I'd imagine that most of you in this room today are probably data scientists. So uh, what I want to share with you is how we help data scientists as well. And what I'm talking about is open source software uh, and also education. I want to hit the next. 
open source software. So we have four different packages. These are our programming packages that we've developed. And what they really allow us to do is to give back to the community in the form of something that's useful. So the first one is TidyQuant. TidyQuant is a financial package that's used around the world by companies um, all over uh, in, in finance. And what we found is it's really being adopted heavily, uh, especially with the adoption of the Tidyverse, which is something that um, is, is very popular uh, in the R programming language. The second one, TimeTK, that one's for time series machine learning. The third one, Sweep, is for tidying the forecast workflow. And the fourth one is our newest package, which is Tibble Time. It's like, uh, if you're familiar with the dplyr package in the Tidyverse, it's like dplyr for time series. So the general theme is, is time series and finance, but um, we get into a lot more than that, too. Next one. All right, courses, I'm gonna save this till the end. I've actually got a big reveal, and I'm uh, very excited about, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Third one. If you, if you take away anything from this talk, go to our website. You can learn from our blog. So this is one of the biggest ways that we give back to data scientists is through our blog on our website. There's a lot of, um, a lot of good posts, good information out there, uh, anywhere from beginner to intermediate to expert. Um, it doesn't matter. It, there's all sorts of um, useful information. All right, so that's business science. All right, next one. So what we're here to talk about today, HR analytics. Using machine learning to predict employee turnover, which is, at, uh, is a huge problem, and we're gonna show how we solve that with two very cool, very um, cutting edge uh, programming packages. The first one is H2O uh, with their automated machine learning, and then the second one is LIME. It stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic I uh, can't remember what the E stands for. Explanation, there we go. So, next one. Next. Employee attrition. So three reasons that um, you should listen to this talk. The first one, employee attrition is a huge problem. Think about it. For a company, an organization, employees are its biggest asset. Second reason, there's new techniques that are out there now. And as I had mentioned, H2O for predicting Lime for explaining, uh, very cutting edge, very useful, uh, and I'll get into more of that in a minute. Third reason, we've got a framework for machine learning in business applications. So the, the cool thing here is I'm actually going to be telling you what I do with consulting uh, firms and giving you the secret sauce. All right, the fourth one is um, not necessarily that our article is, is, is popular, but it's more that our article that we have out there on our blog is valued. Um, we, we can tell this because it's, it's been shared. This is actually an old photo. Uh, it says 755 LinkedIn shares. It's actually upwards of like 1,400. But really, um, I, wanna, I want to give back in the form of code that you guys can follow along with. Um, the next one. All you need to do is just Google predict employee turnover. This will pop up this article, and you'll be able to follow along right with this talk and actually see all of the code that we use. Okay. All right, so getting into the HR, uh, one of the things that we need to understand is that employees are a huge resource. In fact, it's the most important resource that a company has. So I think this quote from Bill Gates really says it all. He says that you take away our top 20 employees and overnight we become a mediocre company. So what is he saying there? Well, first thing, when you dissect it, the top 20 employees, so there is a distribution of employees that are so radically important to that company that if you lose them, you lose your competitive advantage. Um, another way to think about it is that we have a, a situation where people, when they leave a company, that there's a, a huge cost. Next slide. So what are the costs of turnover? Companies face huge costs when employees turn over. Some of these are tangible, but, how, but the most important ones are intangible. So those consist of things like new product ideas, customer relationships, project management, engineering talent, things like that really your organization needs to survive and needs to prosper are lost when a productive employee quits. 
the good news, we've got two new techniques that are out there. As machine learning is evolving, we've got H2O, which Aaron just gave a tremendous talk uh, on with the automated machine learning. That's what I'm going to be talking about, too, how we actually used it for predicting employee turnover. Um, just a few points about it. You can get insanely accurate models just by um, doing very quick and easy um, machine learning without doing a whole lot of feature engineering and all the, the dirty work that goes into a lot of data science. Um, it's really cool and I think it's going to be the future and I, I think we're going to see a lot of transition into this type of approach because it really helps business people concentrate on making decision, decisions rather than worrying about all the features and all the data science behind it. Not that that's not important, but it's just a uh, very important aspect. The second one, Lime. So the great thing about H2O is it gives us a, a great model that's highly accurate. And, it, and it's not necessarily specific to H2O, but the downside with these models, like deep learning, uh, stacked ensembles, they're called black box. So you need special tools to be able to explain what's going on under the hood. And that's what Lime is used for. Okay, a little bit about this problem. Um, so there's actually two slides. Uh, one is that this, this data set came from IBM. So you can imagine that most companies are not just going to hand out their HR data, right? Um, usually they, they consider that proprietary. So um, it's very difficult to go through and, and get that data. So we did the next best thing. We actually got a data set from IBM, which is a consulting firm as well. And uh, the, the, the nice thing about what they're doing is they're using their experience to create this data set. And uh, it's a good data set, very uh, representative of what real world data, both in our experience and I'm sure in IBM's experience. So uh, it was so good, they, they even used it for a case study where they predicted 85% accuracy on the, on the data. So um, this is something that I just wanted to let you know that there's a, this data set that we use out there to basically, uh, it is publicly available, um, but it is artificially generated. And IBM analyzed it. They got 85.6% accuracy on it. So uh, a little bit more about that feature set. The data consists of 35 features. Uh, the first one uh, that is our target is attrition. Uh, it's just a binary classification problem. Yes or no, is that employee uh, churning? There's also things in there like age, business travel, um, what their daily rate, their wages, um, education level, and so on. Uh, there's also 1,470 observations. Each observation is an employee. So uh, 1,470 employees in this data set. All right, the fun stuff. Modeling with H2O. So let me just say that um, this thing was insanely accurate right out of the gate. This is literally all of the code that we had to, to put together uh, to be able to get accurate, highly accurate um, results. So I really want to focus on at the bottom there. So all, all the code at the top is doing is just splitting up the data set. Uh, we, just, we took the raw data, we split it into uh, training tests and validation sets, and then at the bottom, we use this really neat function, h2o.automl, and what that does is it runs all sorts of different models, um, deep learning, ensembles, GBMs, um, and, and it, even under the hood, it does a lot of other stuff that you don't even think about, like pre-processing steps, um, just you know, doing a lot of that data munging that we would normally have to go through. So literally, this is all of the code to make those the predictions. Next. 88% accuracy. That's what we got. Literally, that code on the previous slide, 88%. So our goals were, number one, we were competitive. We wanted to beat IBM. So we accomplished that. Important for our goal, 87.6% 87, 87 accuracy. Highly accurate, 2% above IBM's. More important, recall. 62% recall from this model, which is really important for the business case, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, well, the last one, we'll, we'll skip over this. It's the null error rate, 79%, just so you guys understand. It gives you a feel for the data. If you just pick no, you would get 79% accuracy. So we're getting 9% better accuracy from our model. 
All right, so business implications. What this means is that that organization that implements a model like this can really gain some valuable insights into their employees that can help them prevent and proactively uh, implement steps to, to prevent turnover. So recall is what we want to focus in on, and, and what recall is is just our ability to classify those that are at risk of turnover. So we want to, we'd, we'd rather lean on the side of classifying them than, act, than missing them uh, at the expense of accuracy. So uh, for re recall of 62%, just think of it this way. 62 out of 100 times that employee that is going to quit would be accurately uh, identified as, uh, as quitting. Precision is the other one, and I'm, I'm not going to belabor it just for the, the sake of time, but um, you just don't, you don't want to see precision drop down to zero, but it's, it's not nearly as important for the business case as recall is. All right, so H2O, auto ML, amazing. Great model, um, we've got highly accurate, but as you can probably know from the business case, if you've ever dealt with a company, the accuracy is probably the, the least of their focus. What they want to be able to do is they want to know what can they do, what levers do they have to be able to adjust things in order to uh, prevent turnover. So we've got a great model. How do we prevent it? And that's what Lime is for, local interpre interpretable model agnostic explanation. So basically what Lime is doing underneath the hood is running a lot of permutations of linear models. And, it's, and, and the theory behind it is you've got a, a black box model. It might be a deep learning model or a stacked ensemble. And you know, your, your model is like this. But on the local level, it actually can be approximated by linear models, which are more explainable. And, and what it does is it, it does that thousands and thousands of times, by default, 5,000. So the beauty of this is on a local level, we can actually understand why that model, that deep learning model, um, is specific to an, or, uh, an observation, is saying yes or no that that employee is going to uh, churn. So we'll see a little bit more about that, but it's really, um, it's, it's for, the, for the business implication, it couldn't be a better situation. All right, so Lime, um, one more thing about it. It's now integrated with H2O. So I worked with uh, Thomas Peterson, Thomas Lynn Peterson, who ported uh, over the Lime um, concept from Python into R. So he's, got the, he's the maintainer of the package, and I worked with him to get H2O integrated. So now, um, if you actually go through the article online, you'll see a bunch of extra like, steps that we had to take. But um, we were really able to now cut out a bunch of those extra functions uh, and just run Lime uh, seamlessly. Okay, here's how you use Lime. Uh, the first thing you do is you cr create an explainer object. And basically, this, all this is doing is creating a recipe for the next step. The next step here is really when you create that explainer. So that explainer from the previous slide, all it did was it took your training set and your model and created that recipe. In this step, whoops, go back. Thank you. Um, in this step, what we're doing is actually taking a subset of our observations that we're interested in, and then we're running it with the explainer object. And a uh, few arguments I want to point you to, end features, four. So that's going to produce our top four features for whatever cases we provide to it. And then the last one is the kernel width. You adjust that in order to um, tune your, your Lyme response to, to make sure you're getting a good fit from your model. All right, so that produces an explanation. Then what, what it has is this cool function called plot features to visualize the explanation. So you can actually just go through, and it, you can see from the visualization, we've got four cases here. Each case has the top four features listed for that model explaining why it picked yes or no for attrition. Okay. And then the last thing that we can do is then we can understand globally, we can compare it to what's going on in our model. So what we saw when we did this process was two features jumped out. We, we looked at 10 observations, and consistently, um, the features that were in those observations over time and job role tended to be high predictors of attrition. So from, once you start to d dive into those, those features that, are, that tend to be more important, you get to see, OK, this is why things are happening within that model. It becomes much more explainable, and that's great for the business case, because that's exactly what they need to know to be able to make their decisions. 
All right. So we talked a lot about a hypothetical example. In the real world, though, does this, does this work? What we found is that a Fortune 500 firm came to us wanting to predict executive potential. We were able to implement a slightly different process, but more sophisticated. Um, and we were able to identify, using a similar approach, 16 employees that uh, were considered executive potential that the model predicted as executive potential, but they weren't currently being targeted. So it does work. All right, conclusions. Um, high accuracy from H2O, high explainability from uh, Lime, and you now have a framework that we can actually apply with, with clients uh, for high accuracy and explainability. So we're done, right? No. Um, couple things here. We don't know if the model is, how do, how do we know that the model's right? We haven't back tested it. There's a time aspect of it that we need to consider. Uh, it's, it's a very cross-sectional analysis, and the only thing that's certain is that things will change over time. So, adaptive solution. That's where the adaptive solution comes in. We build AI into the systems. These are learning solutions with that feedback loop, so that way we can uh, continuously adapt as things change. All right, what about communication? So this is a picture of an app. We actually have some updated apps on our website. Um, these are really what we build, examples of what we build for clients to be able to identify whether or not um, you know, people are going to churn or customers are going to be lost. Uh, and it allows the, the, the clients to actually have a scorecard to be able to, um, uh, be able to actually interface with the machine learning without n having to know all, all about data science, okay? All right, so quickly, we're kind of running out of time. I want to save a little bit of time for um, question and answer, but um, if, if you want any of my information, take a picture now uh, because we're about to roll a video, and I'm super excited about this. This is the first time publicly that I'm talking about uh, our next phase in business science. We're, we're getting ready to roll out a new educational platform. It's called Business Science University, and uh, we have a video that I want to show you. It only takes a minute and a half, but I think um, you'll understand uh, what the benefits are for people that are new coming into data science that want to learn how to apply data science for business. university.business-science.io. I want you guys to um, understand that we are committed to educating data scientists as well. So we aren't just all about you know, uh, driving our business with the, on the client end. We really want to drive it with the data science end as well. We've been giving out a lot of good information on our blog, and we're about to take that to the next level. What we're rolling out now is university.business-science.io. That's our business science university. And in, in early 2018, we're going to be rolling out two new courses with H2O involved. Um, the first course is going to be how to use HR analytics to prevent employee turnover. And we're going to take it to the next level by adding additional uh, features in there on how to build a recommender system. 
and then the second course is going to be an extension. It's going to take the model that you build in the first course and actually turn it into a shiny web app uh, to actually distribute that to um, a, no, uh, a non-technical person so they can um, have the advantage of machine learning without the, uh, the, the technical details, okay? All right, thank you very much. Okay, so the first question, what if real data instead of simulated one are highly sparse? So um, the automated machine learning algorithm, and probably Aaron's probably the best one to explain what it's all doing underneath the hood, but what, from what I understand, it really takes care of a lot of the, the typical or common data science issues that you might run into. So sparse data um, could be an issue, um, I think it has things to deal with that. However, it's gonna depend on the data, so we'd have to take a look at it and really try it out. Okay, next one. Is there a way to use Lime on data with a lot of missing values without imputation? So, uh, missing values, you have to have a way to deal with them. So even the automated machine learning isn't going to work with uh, missing values. You have to either fill them in with like negative 99s or uh, impute them somehow. You, you have to have a, a, a way to deal with it. Um, Lime, the same thing. So the Lime is based on your model. So you have to have a, a, a functional model in order to be able to run it. So uh, in my opinion, I don't think Lime would work well with, without um, imputed values. Okay, what, what kind of main features are most useful as for your employee turnover prediction? So um, the employee turnover prediction model that we saw here, um, the most highly correlated uh, variables from the feature importance that, that Lime generated, that was um, the, uh, whether or not they were working overtime and what their job role was. So in the interest of time, I kind of had to go, go through those slides pretty quickly. But the overtime, what, what, we, found, <clears throat> what we found was that if uh, the, the population of employees that were not working overtime were much, much less likely to turn over. So if you think about it, what the, the, the natural um, uh, logical conclusion out of that is to try and help them out with, uh, have that manager help reduce the, the work life or help the work life balance. So um, that was the one issue. The other one was uh, the sales uh, representatives. The, the role, the job role was, was very key. So sales representatives were turning at like 40% whereas like managers and some of the other roles were only churning at like 4%. So it, it ended up being very um, uh, dependent, highly dependent on uh, the job role, which if you think about it is, is like a cohort within your data. It's a way to kind of group different like people together um, and certain groups uh, churned at much higher rates. All right, any other questions? What, what is the real life accuracy for your employee prediction model? So um, accuracy, uh, the accuracy on this model, on the test data set, so this was un unseen data, was 87%, or excuse me, 88%. The uh, real life accuracy, I, I would consider that the real life accuracy because it's uh, on, a, on a holdout set, unseen data from the model. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would consider the real life accuracy. Okay? All right, thank you very much.